Hi, Rick. Hi. Nice to see you in Montreux. You have in your hand the album that you have done here in Montreux. Oh, yes. Well, what, I never. What kind of souvenir do you have about this album? Well, I have some very fond memories of it, of roller skates and cap guns and stuff, because when we made this album, we... Uh, we, all, we were all into roller skating and every night after the session we would uh, roller skate back to the hotel armed with uh, cap guns and we would be ambushing one another and uh, just being silly really. And I think we were consuming quite a lot of alcohol at the time, which is not the best thing to do when you're going to get on a pair of roller skates. And I remember roller skating through the town here. Um, and I was going at a rate of knots and this a woman walked out of a, of a hairdresser's just having had her hair done with a bag full of shopping and stuff and I, I roller skated straight into her and knocked her over and, uh, and completely unintentionally obviously and uh, I helped, sort of helped her up but I think she wanted to have me arrested and I was kind of lucky to, uh, to get out of it by inviting her to a concert, got her in for half price and all that you know. But. I was thinking about memories about work. Oh, work. I didn't do any work. <laughs> I don't remember doing anything about the work. No, it was funny because it was the last place that John Coglin was, was here with us as well because we'd spent... Um, Francis and I were here uh, setting things up and getting the sound right and uh, we'd, we'd set the kit up. Francis in those days used to tune John's kit for him. And uh, we tuned it all up with the help of the engineer and got it all right. And then John arrived and uh, played it very briefly and then kicked it over and kicked it all over the studio. And that was when we kind of had the, the ruck and uh, said to John, you know, that's it. I think you've probably had enough. And um, that was when he left. So it's all, it's all happened here. Yeah. And we made quite a good album as well. Is it important for you to come back at the Montreux Jazz Festival? It, it's, uh, it's a shame we're not here for a bit longer because it's, I mean, as you can see, I mean, the backdrop is just amazing. You wake up and see that first thing in the morning, it puts you in an averagely good mood, you know. And it's just nice to be here and it's got the kudos, hasn't it? You know, it's the Montreux Jazz Festival. It's known all over the world and it's, it's, it's great to be part of it. You have here your own guitar, which is almost as famous as you. No, it's not. I just borrowed this off Rick Parfit. He just let me borrow it for a while. I couldn't believe he's let me have it, but... Do you remember when, where are this guitar does come from? It came from Scotland, um, Glasgow, in a shop in Glasgow. Um, I just spotted it by chance. I wasn't looking for a guitar. I was out and I don't know what I was looking for but I wasn't looking for a guitar and I, I saw it in a window and I just liked it and I think I gave uh, 80 pounds for it I think. Um, God knows when, a long long time ago and uh, I, j I just went in and played it and I loved it and just bought it. It, was, it looked a lot better then I suppose you could say because it wasn't all beaten up like this and it, it had a full it had a full paint job on it then, um, which it hasn't really got now. This has happened over the years from wearing belts on your jeans, and uh, that's how that's happened. It's really grooved now. But there's just something about this. Uh, it's um, I don't know what I'd do, actually, if, if this ever got broken or lost it. I mean, it's always looked after with kid gloves. This is always handled so carefully, and... I'm starting to get a spinal tap moment here. <laughs> Look at it, don't touch it, will you? Because, but it's just such a fantastic... Even without an amplifier, it's, it's the most beautiful guitar. What is the value of this guitar? Today? I don't know. For me, it's priceless because I, you know, I couldn't replace it. So, you know, you could offer me what you wanted for this and... Well, you might get it. <laughs> Rick, you're 16 now, but how old are you when you're on stage? Oh, must be 59. Certainly no, no older than that. Still feel like a kid on there. By halfway through, I'm 60. You don't want to worry about that. When we get as far as as far as down, down, sometimes uh, uh, it, it hurts. It starts to hurt. At the end of uh, Roll Over, Lay Down, I end up on the far side of the stage as opposed to the far side of the moon. I end up 
far side of the stage and to get back sometimes across the stage I can hardly walk and uh, it does you know it takes it out of you you know when you're, you're leaping around for an hour and 50 minutes um, it does take it out of you and you can tend to feel 60 on there yeah and when you see in front of you at the first row young people Knowing your song, singing your song. Young people, young 49, 50 year olds, these <laughs> youngsters down the front, yeah. I have seen some uh, uh, teenagers yeah. in front of you, yeah. and singing your songs, uh, what, what do you feel about it? Well, uh, it never ceases to amaze me, to be honest, to, to see, uh, I mean, younger than that. I mean, you, you see some kids of eight, nine, ten years old down there, you know, and they're rocking away, and they're, they've got their t-shirts on, they're singing the songs. And it's, it's quite incredible. I, I suppose it's, uh, you know, it's down to the parents, really, I guess, who've grown up with us and then they've, they've, they've turned the kids on to Quo and, and they're there, you know, having a good time, enjoying themselves and it's, it's amazing to see. And some nights, I mean, down the front, it really is like a crash inside the barrier. And you see kids along there, really like five, six-year-old kids, they're asleep. Is it fun for you, for you today to play pictures of Magic Men, to play Mean Girl, to play Ice in the Sun on stage? Love it. I love it. Particularly uh, Mean Girl, I just love. Wanted to do that, put that back in the set for a long time. It's, uh, it, just, it just goes there, you know. It, it's, it's great to play and you see the reaction from the audience because it's quite high energy. And uh, I love it. And uh, Matchstick Men on its night is good. We tried it so many times before. We, well, so many times. We've, we've put it back in the set two or three times, and it's never worked. And this time at rehearsals, um, we, we we dug into it a bit more, and you know, raised it from the the ashes, as it were. And, you know, made it a little bit different, and uh, and cut the arrangement down a bit. And it, it works now. It works. It works well on, on the night. And Ice in the Sun is just, well, you know, one of those classics. And I think it's nice for the audience to see, you know, both sides of Quo, to see the, the, the heavy side, if you like, uh, from, you know, your down downs and roll over, lay down and rain and that sort of stuff. And then to see us doing almost like ditties, like Ice in the Sun. Um, I think it's, you know, it's as, as varied as we can get it for them. Rick, is there anything which could have led you to quit the business? For example, if a woman has asked you one day to choose between her and status quo? No, there, there, there were, over the years, there, there would have been uh, no contest, I don't think. I mean, the band has always been my life, and uh, I mean, it's always been what I've done, and I, I don't think I could ever stop doing the band. Fortunately, I haven't been in a position like that, and I haven't been asked to do that, to quit. Um, but I would never quit what I do. I mean, you know, I, I could never leave status quo, and I, I heard somebody say the other night, I hope quo never leaves me. You know, I, I think I'll always, uh, I'll always do this. As long as I'm able, I will always do this, and nothing, nothing will stop me doing this, I don't think. 